Welcome to the Long Island Pine Barren Society program. I'm Dick Amper. And I'm Kathleen Nasta, and we're here today at the Radisson Hotel in Hop Hog at the 8th Annual What Are We Going to Do Conference. What are we going to yes, do? Yes, yes. Yes, we're going to educate everybody <laughs> on the latest efforts to improve water quality across Long Island. So let's get started. Please join us. Hey, I'm with Mary Ann Teller, and tell us a little bit about what we can expect from you today. Sure. So we'll go behind the scenes a little bit on the subwatersheds plan and tell how we identified how much nitrogen we need to reduce, both for groundwater protection and surface water protection. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. We're talking with Bill Corbell from News 12. Uh, he's being honored today for his coverage of the water issues on Long Island. So, Bill, can you tell us about the work that you've done on News 12 that you're being honored for today? Well, this is mainly Dr. Chris Gobler's work. And he uh, tests the waters around the island. He sent the information to us and me over at News 12. And for the last, I guess it's been three summers, we put it on air weekly through the summer, educating the folks of Long Island and everyone else about the problems with our marine ecosystem. That's really great. And thank you so much for getting that news out there. Well, it was my pleasure. And, and hopefully we opened a few eyes because as uh, I've said to people, without the water around Long Island, we're not Long Island, we're just long. <laughs> very good, very good. Thank you. Okay. Good morning and uh, welcome to the eighth annual Water We're Going to Do. I'm Dick Amper. I'm the executive director of the Long Island Pine Barrens Society. Um, we're partners comprised of the Long Island uh, Drinking Water Program, along with uh, Citizens Campaign for the Environment, uh, the Nature Conservancy, uh, Gobler Laboratory at uh, Stony Brook, and um, we said Citizens Campaign, Group for the East End, God, the Nature Conservancy. So the group has 100 uh, organizational members, 17,000 individual members concerned about the health of our, our water. And uh, we're going to hear a lot about it today. The conference is presented by the partnership and graciously sponsored by the Roush Foundation. This year's program will review the significant progress we've made in the campaign to restore Long Island's water quality. We'll discuss the current state of our waters, the action plans that are in place now to address nitrogen pollution and emerging contaminants, water conservation issues, and the further actions we need to take in the upcoming years. We'll also be honoring an environmental leader this morning. Surprise coming right up. As you know, all of island, the island's water comes from a network of underground aquifers, groundwater sources, which have been contaminated principally by nitrogen from wastewater and fertilizers, but which also are the result of contaminated uh, volatile organic compounds, even prescription drugs. The water quality crisis has been demonstrated by closed shellfish beds, fish die-offs, and closed beaches. This year's report on the state of algae blooms in Long Island's water this past summer is deeply troubling. On the other hand, county and state cleanup efforts are very encouraging. We'll hear about that, too. Our opening speaker this morning will be Dr. Chris Gobler of Stony Brook University's School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Dr. Gobler will be presenting the state of Long Island's water today. Chris Gobler. Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here. It's good to see everybody. And um, I think we'll just go ahead and get started. So, uh, of course, the overarching principle here is the fact that Long Island is one large watershed. Every single drop of water that falls on Long Island, importantly, becomes either our drinking water or discharges into our coastal waters. Uh, and therefore, that means any activity on land is going to have an effect on our drinking water or our coastal waters. We know the trends with regards to change over time with regards to the population of Suffolk County, uh, increasing by an order of magnitude in population through the 20th century, uh, and the concurrent rise in groundwater nitrogen levels. And, um, and if you've uh, seen the sub-watersheds report and spoken to Suffolk County, um, you probably know that this rise in nitrogen is wastewater. Uh, Suffolk County sub-watershed study is very clear 
every, almost every of the 200 plus water, sub watersheds that were investigated found that uh, the primary source of nitrogen was wastewater, consistent with other studies that have been done over the last decades. There's mounting evidence. Each study comes to the same exact conclusion. Uh, we know, of course, that all that nitrogen discharging, that wastewater nitrogen discharging into surface waters has significant effects on water quality uh, and water quality impairment. And you can see here the dozens of sites uh, that have, and this is just from summer 2018, 2019, look very, very similar, but dozens of lakes and ponds with blue-green algae blooms, dozens of locations with oxygen below the three milligram per liter threshold, which the DEC says that we should never go below in order to protect aquatic life, uh, and many other harmful algal blooms. Uh, and there are, of course, always emerging issues. Um, who wants to look out of Great South Bay wants it to, to look like this? Uh, I just th think this to be a horrific uh, view of Great South Bay. And what this is, is an invasive macroalgae. This is supposed to be living in Japan spread through Europe, has now sp starting to spread across New York, and we've just documented in the last year, uh, in fact, just this fall, this has spread all over Great South Bay. And guess what? Makes it grow really, really fast. Yeah, we're about to publish the paper showing that it's excessive levels of nitrogen and carbon dioxide, so it's a climate change effect, uh, that's making this spread all throughout Long Island. Outside of our marine systems, we're now beginning to really worry about our freshwater bodies, our lakes and ponds, uh, because they're filled oftentimes with cyanobacteria, also known as, excuse me, blue-green algae. Uh, here are the two most common we see on Long Island, microcystis and anabena, that make microcystin, a gastrointestinal toxin, and the neurotoxin anatoxin A. If you didn't know these compounds when they were first discovered, before they had these names, were called fast death factor and very fast death factor. And it's funny, but it's, it's, uh, these are actually serious compounds. Uh, they're carcinogenic in humans. Uh, the CDC has released this report demonstrating clearly there's been hundreds of cases of dog poisonings uh, through the years. And we had a horrific week in this country in August. In one week, 10 dogs died uh, in four different states across the country. And in each case, they were able to affirm that it was because of the consumption of blue-green algae and the, specifically their toxins. Uh, you can see the headlines here. Uh, and this was a large number, but I can tell you this happens every year uh, in the United States, in the summer in particular. Uh, the DEC, therefore, carefully tracks these blooms all over uh, New York State. And uh, if you can't see the details here, they have data on all 62 counties across New York State. Uh, 50 of those 62 have blue-green algae blooms, but none has more than Suffolk County. And if you can't see the number here, um, it's nearly two dozen, uh, almost double the closest county. Another event that is definitely one you could never miss is these rust tide blooms known as cochlidinium that occur on the eastern end of Long Island, but recently have spread to Great South Bay and on the North Shore. Uh, they're known as ichthyotoxic because they can kill fish. These are pictures that I actually took from our marine lab in Southampton when we accidentally ha had water from a bloom taken into the lab. Um, and this is also from our marine lab, August 2018, where we had out uh, tens of thousands of shellfish, you can see here in bags, uh, and we unfortunately lost almost all of them. This is what was left after the bloom came in, and only a matter of a couple of days. Uh, and it's been shown, of course, in the literature that this, in addition to killing fish, this is also an uh, organism capable of ki killing off uh, shellfish. Uh, the last impairment I'll talk about is oxygen. Uh, the DEC, as I already indicated, indicates that we always want to have at least three milligrams per liter of oxygen. Maybe we could keep it above five, and that would be pre preferable. Um, but through some monitoring our laboratory has done over the years, We've got more than five years of data over 30 sites across all of Long Island. Uh, and this is how the sites measure up. Um, the details, you can see where the names of the different locations are, but uh, of almost 30 sites, 17 of them didn't even fail the minimum DO standard at least once each summer. Uh, there's some in the middle, six that failed the moderate DO standard, and only seven achieved the standard throughout. Uh, which shows clearly things are not measuring up when it comes to oxygen as well. Uh, and then 
if you hadn't seen the news just last week, we've had a major die-off of bay scallops on the east end of Long Island. There's almost, there's literally no harvest this year. I know many, many baymen, they're not even bothering. They went out the first day, and after getting all of, say, a dozen scallops in three hours, they've thrown in a towel. Um, now, we don't know the actual cause of this, but what I can tell you is that years of research has shown that the temperatures in the bays are getting warmer. With that, just naturally, oxygen levels are getting lower. And this organism, the bay scallop, is the most sensitive of all the shellfish. And even minor environmental perturbations, like temperatures that are warmer, oxygen levels that are lower, can lead to mortality. Um, and so, with the point being then, we need the oxygen levels as high as possible, and we know when there's high levels of algae that decay, that leads to lower than ideal levels of oxygen. So how do we reverse all this? Just wrapping up very quickly, and we're going to hear more about it, but I just certainly want to echo the point that we know, as I already mentioned, that the septic tanks and cesspools are leaving to the very high levels of nitrogen in our groundwater. Um, but we also know there's a way out now via uh, Article 19 through Suffolk County. We're going to hear all more about this, but I just, you just want to emphasize we've got many different systems in the ground now that are commercially available. Uh, the Center for Clean Water Technology at Stony Brook has also developed a series of systems, three different nitrogen remo removing biofilters. Um, and all of these systems lead to levels of effluent that are far lower than what your system releases today. Uh, and I, I just want to say very quickly, sometimes I hear like, oh, maintain your septic system. Right? You don't want a failing septic system. Failing septic systems and perfectly working old septic systems and cesspools release the same amount of nitrogen. And in fact, it's possible that a failing system releases a little bit less than a perfectly functioning system. So it's not about whether your system, your old system is functioning or not. It's about the type of system that you're using and that these new advanced systems lead to a significant reduction in nitrogen load. Uh, and with that, it's my great honor uh, to call up Mr. Bill Corbell. Bill, will you come up, please? So Bill Corbell is up here because he's getting, the, from the Long Island Clean Water Partnership, the Environmental Achievement Award. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, um, in addition to being a spectacular weatherman for decades on News 12, who we all turn to in times of crisis, like a blizzard or a uh, hurricane or whatever else, um, Bill was open to the idea of communicating water quality impairment to the public. And so I reached out to Bill uh, in 2014 and I had a conversation with him about the idea that we're doing all this monitoring within coastal waters and there are times when the water conditions are quite good and places where they're quite good, but there's also places where there are problems and we think that the community and the public should know about this. He got it out on the, the, uh, the nightly news every Thursday night uh, and I think it raised great awareness and people understanding what was going on where. Uh, and he did a very, he did an excellent job of providing a narrative. Not only is the water quality good, fair, or poor, but why is that? Uh, and I think it's made, it made a huge difference. So he, in addition to being a great public servant, well, just not public servant, servant to Long Island with regards to weather, uh, I think he's an environmental champion. And for that, he's getting the Environmental Achievement Award. So Bill, come on up. That is really cool. That's better than an Emmy, which I never got. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you know, really, we need more than just one of these because he's the reason <laughs> that I got this. And uh, I didn't realize it was, it's was. it been six years. Yeah. Really incredible. So, uh, you know, thanks to, to Chris and his team over at Stony Brook University with the marvelous job they do. Thanks also to uh, Pat Dolan, my news director back then, who was kind of uh, uh, pushed this along as well. And of course, the News 12, Long Island, which uh, continues and hopefully will even next year, although I'm not there, continue to put this very important information up on the TV for everyone, uh, everyone to see. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me here and, and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks to Chris Gobler. Thanks, Bill Corbell. Next, we're going to move to a discussion on action plans that are in place right now to address the nitrogen pollution that has been plaguing our waters for decades. 
We would like to call up our first panel speakers, Sue Van Patten, Ken Ziegel, and Mary Ann Taylor. Um, my name is Susan Van Patten. I work for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and I am the Long Island Nitrogen Action Coordinator for DEC, uh, also known as LINAP. So just to recap, in the 2015-16 state budget, um, there was $5 million that, are, that was appropriated for DEC in the Long Island Regional Action, um, Long Island Regional Planning Council to create the Line App program. Um, we had some basic goals. Um, first was to assess the nitrogen pollution that's out there, um, to identify where it's coming from, so the sources, to look at endpoints so we know where we're headed and when we get there, and then obviously to implement, because we all want it to be better. We all want um, improvement of water quality. Obviously, residential wastewater is something that LINAP is working on. Um, we all know what's the biggest source of nitrogen pollution. Um, both counties, Nassau and Suffolk, pr were provided funding through the New York State Septic System Replacement Program um, to encourage residents to replace their septic systems and cesspools. So that is in place. Suffolk County's program is well underway, as we all know. Um, NASA's is starting, um, and Suffolk County's also obviously put their own money in as well as state money. Both counties are also working on public sewering. Um, I think everybody knows at Bay Park a lot of work has been done there to improve it, and a lot of work is on the table for consolidating, improving, um, and building the ocean outfall all along the south shore of Nassau County. Suffolk County also was looking at sewering. Carl's River, Forge River, those are all um, those are all uh, sewing projects that are underway. State and federal dollars have helped the counties with their projects. Uh, fertilizer management, second leading cause of nitrogen um, pollution is fertilizer management. We have a working group that we worked with extensively and created um, a long set of recommendations for how to use uh, fertilizer in residential settings in a very, um, in a uh, responsible way. Um, those recommendations are on the line app web pages, on the DEC web page, um, website. Um, in short, what we're recommending is apply a smaller amount every time you apply, um, apply a lower amount over the course of the season, use a 50% slow release fertilizer, and we're also calling on manufacturers that to right size their bag. So if somebody does want to just buy a lower, to apply less fertilizer, that their bag is kind of a single use bag. Um, Nitrogen Smart Communities, this is a program we're putting together with Long Island Regional Planning Council. It's um, similar to the uh, Climate Smart Communities in that the idea is to encourage municipalities to um, take ownership for nitrogen actions in their community and to actually do something. We're going to be even providing communities with um, not only a document to tell them how to step through and create their own community-specific plan, but also um, giving them local data so that they'll know exactly where they should be focusing in terms of which source of nitrogen should they be um, looking at. Uh, nutrient extraction, this is another where we have a partnership with Long Island Sound. They're funding our um, uh, bio-extraction coordinator for us, and the concept here is we all know that some embayments are not going to um, have total water quality improvement through, the, um, through just wastewater activities, either septic or public. So we're going to have to put in different, we're going to have to have additional um, techniques. And so the bio extraction, what it is, is you cultivate and harvest shellfish uh, and or seaweed, and then that removes the, the nitrogen, the, excuse me, the nitrogen. That's what I have. Thanks, Sue. Uh, next up, we have uh, Ken Ziegel. He's Associate Public Health Engineer for the Suffolk County Department of Health Services. He'll be discussing Suffolk County Subwatershed's wastewater plan. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Amper. So this particular graphic here is a graphic that we generated for the, for the study. And what it represents is the average water quality for our marine water bodies uh, that are grouped by subwatershed priority rank. And so the water bodies that are priority rank four for wastewater upgrades are the lowest priority and generally have the best water quality uh, in Suffolk County. Water bodies that are ranked as priority rank one are water bodies that are the highest priority for wastewater upgrades and generally have the poorest water quality. And as you look at this graphic and you look at this table uh, and you move up from the bottom to the top, we see our good water quality water bodies in priority rank four with low nitrogen, in water nitrogen, low predicted nitrogen load, high dissolved oxygen, 
no harmful algal blooms, low chlorophyll A, and excellent water clarity. And as we advance forward uh, incrementally towards priority rank one, we see an incremental increase in very high nitrogen, uh, very high predicted nitrogen load, lower dissolved oxygen, significant increase in the number of harmful algal blooms over the last 10 years for these water bodies compared to priority rank four, and significant increase in water clarity and corresponding decrease, uh, excuse me, significant increase in chlorophyll A and corresponding decrease in water clarity. So unequivocal evidence that more nitrogen equals water quality degradation in our surface water bodies in Suffolk County. And so as Dr. Gober and uh, Mr. Ampter men mentioned before, all of our water system in Suffolk County is connected. So not only is surface water a problem, our vulnerable sorceress drinking water aquifer is a problem as well. <clears throat> and while we generally don't have a problem in our larger public supply well network, keep in mind that the upper glacial aquifer, the shallow aquifer, provides that nitrogen that feeds our embayments as well. The county also has approximately 35,000 private supply wells that do provide drinking water to private uh, residents in Suffolk County. And so some interesting data, 18% of the samples for the private supply wells have concentrations of nitrogen between six and 10 milligrams per liter. And an additional 11% of the samples have total nitrogen concentrations above the state standard of 10 milligrams per liter. What is the Subwatershed's Wastewater Plan? It's an environmental benefit project designed to provide a recommended roadmap to our policymakers on how to address the 380,000 existing on-site disposal systems in Suffolk County that are not designed to remove nitrogen with new nitrogen-removing technologies to restore and protect our surface water resources. The plan does this by setting priority areas for surface waters and groundwaters, <clears throat> establishing load reduction goals for surface water and groundwater, and Mary Ann Taylor is gonna talk more about the load reduction goal methodology that we used. When we combine the priority areas and load reduction goals with a cost analysis, the plan describes how, when, and where to install wastewater upgrades. And ultimately what the plan is doing in its simplest form, it's it's addressing the single greatest factor, which is nitrogen from existing wastewater sources that we can manage to restore and protect our surface water quality. This is the first study uh, countywide wastewater evaluation, a policy that's been done since the 1978 208 study. All right, so the, what's the primary recommendation of the Subwater Sids Wastewater Plan? The primary recommendation is a countywide phased wastewater upgrade program. Program consists of recommendation of four phases. Uh, phase one is what we call program ramp up and what we're calling basically getting our chess pieces in place so that we have the policies and procedures in place sufficient to advance to the primary program phase, which is called phase two. So of paramount importance during phase one is we need to establish a stable and recurring revenue source to make the cost of wastewater upgrades affordable to the homeowners in Suffolk County. Uh, county executive has said all along that this wastewater program cannot advance unless it is affordable to the homeowners of Suffolk County. In addition, during program ramp up, we need to continue to build the industry and a responsible management entity responsible for overseeing the installation of these new systems. Uh, we're gonna implement the existing SCREE sewer projects that we have. The county has already been awarded uh, $440 million of federal funding to advance sewer projects in the highest priority areas in Suffolk County. Once we have our stable recurring revenue source identified, then we would advance to phase two, which is the primary program phase of the project. And phase two focuses on the highest priority areas for wastewater upgrades in the county. And for the purposes of the subwatersheds plan, the highest priority areas were defined as surface water priority rank one areas, groundwater priority rank one areas, and all near shore areas to surface water bodies. So what we define as all zero to two groundwater contributing areas to all surface water bodies in Suffolk County. That's roughly 172,000 upgrades over a period of 32 years. Once we complete phase two, then we would advance to phase three, which attacks all the remaining priority areas in Suffolk County, an additional 76,000 upgrades over a period of 15 years. And then last but not least, we would advance to phase four, which is the final phase of the project, focusing mostly on the areas that are in central Suffolk County, uh, very long travel times to service waters and to drinking water and supply wells. Thank you.
Thanks, Ken. Next, Marianne Taylor, Vice President of CDM Smith, a consultant of Suffolk County, will elaborate on the subwatershed uh, wastewater plan a little bit further. Um, first thing we had to do was define what we wanted our water quality to look like. So the county assembled a whole team of um, experts from academia, from the state, from the federal agency, people who have spent their whole careers studying surface water quality. Working with them and based on the available data that the county had, we identified a number of endpoints. First, dissolved oxygen. 90% of all the samples would have to be greater than, 90% of all the samples over the last 10 years would have to be greater than the state's criteria of 4.8 milligrams per liter. Um, I'm gonna jump down to SECI depth. It's a measure of water clarity. That's important for two reasons, right? Nobody wants their water to look like what Chris showed the, uh, the tide bloom. Um, but also the New York State um, task force on, on seagrass had identified that secchi depth, a secchi depth of greater than two meters as required to provide sufficient light down to the bottom for um, healthy seagrass beds to thrive. So that was another criteria. Chlorophyll A kind of works both ways. You need um, a little bit of productivity there, but a maximum concentration of 5.5 micrograms per liter is related to that two meter secchi depth. And then the county also had an extensive database on harmful algal blooms. So we decided the water body, in order to be a reference water body, can have no harmful algal blooms with primarily health impacts over the past 10 years and no more than one um, harmful algal bloom with primarily environmental impacts. And then lo and behold, when we compare that to the county's um, water quality database, there are 28 water um, surface waters that exhibited that water quality. Um, they're primarily uh, well flushed waters downstream of um, less densely developed areas you can see here. And from then on, we just had to look at those unit nitrogen loads, how much nitrogen is being input per cubic meter of receiving water. And we also had to consider the residence time, which was um, calculated by HDR using it under separate contract to New York State. Looking at all those surface waters, we came up with an average unit nitrogen load residence time of 0.128, and then again it became a math problem. How much nitrogen would have to be removed from all the other subwatersheds to reach that level? There were a number of other examples that we looked at relating minimum dissolved oxygen, diurnal di dissolved oxygen, harmful algal blooms, chlorophyll A, and so forth. We assembled them all together and came up with these estimated nitrogen load reductions required to achieve that ideal water quality. Ranges from very low in the areas along the North Shore to very high in the more densely developed areas of the South Shore in particular. Um, and so how do we do when we simulated the subwatersheds plan implementation? We um, achieved less than four milligrams per liter and all the raw water from all the public supply wells, except I'm gonna say about four. They were all simulated to be less than 10. Browns Hills, for example, there's other things going on there. And then for the surface water, this is what we use to kind of judge how successful this plan implementation would be. And you can see after the IAs and the sewer projects are implemented, we're predicting that we're gonna be achieving that ideal water quality in most parts of the county, and we're gonna come a long way really in achieving it in the rest. So this is step one, and as Ken mentioned, there's gonna be a, a, lot of, um, a lot of monitoring and feedback going on to see what's working, what's not working, what we still have to learn more about. And uh, that's it. So that was a really great program we heard today. That's right. We got a lot of new information about what we're doing, where we're going, and how to improve water quality. That's what this is all about. Yeah, I think it was really productive. So. Join us again next time. I'm Dick Camper. I'm Kathleen Nasta. Be See well. You then. Yep. So, so that yeah, was good. It was really awesome.